today we're going to talk about neuromodulation in Dravet syndrome. Uh, so we've already heard a lot about medication therapies. We've heard about surgical therapies um, as it pertains to medication refractory epilepsy. Later we're going to hear about ketogenic diet and diet therapy. Neuromodulation is something that does come up in our office. It comes up with our patients and it comes up for our families. Uh, so neuromodulation, the idea behind it, again, is that seizures are caused by a synchronized firing of an inappropriate network of neurons. Now, we can use electrical currents to suppress the neuronal firing or interfere with the synchronized firing of a population of neurons. Uh, the electrical stimulation of the central nervous system is performed in order to prevent seizures or to reduce the frequency, the duration, or the severity. There's two different types of um, devices that we look at in terms of neuromodulation. There's open loop and closed loop devices. So with both types of devices, the open loop and the closed loop, a therapy is delivered using a pre-programmed settings. We know how much current we're going to give. We know how long we're going to give it for. It turns on and off at set periods of time. In an open loop setting, um, it's unaffected by what's happening with the patient itself. In the closed loop setting, um, it can actually, the therapy can be modulated in response to different things that are happening to the patient. So, um, and, we're, and in terms of the devices that we have available, the open loop devices are the traditional VNS, the vagus nerve stimulator, uh, deep brain stimulation, and transmetic, transmagnetic stimulation. The closed loop devices will include the cardiac responsive VNS, known as the Aspire SR, which came out last year, uh, as well as Neuropace, or responsive neurostimulation. So this is what I think a lot of us are, are very familiar with, the vagus nerve stimulator. The generator is placed here in the chest. There's a wire that um, attaches from the generator, coils around the vagus nerve, turns on, turns off, turns on, turns off. And over a period of time, uh, we think that it um, signals through the brainstem into the thalamus and then to areas that are involved in epileptogenesis. How does it work? So as Dr. Miller said already, um, how it works is helpful, um, but in many cases, we don't know exactly how most of our, uh, our tools work, unfortunately. With the VNS, it's thought to innervate the, um, the nucleus tractus solitarius, and it innervate, innervates the locus ceruleus, um, and then eventually to the thalamus and the cortex. So the cortex, again, is a thin layer up here where we feel that a lot of our seizures are generated from, and we believe that the VNS um, causes an increased synaptic activity in the thalamocortical projections, um, and that can decrease the synchrony of synaptic activity between and within cortical regions. Um, now, this can also affect other parts of the brain that are involved in seizures, including the limbic system. Uh, VNS uh, specifically is approved in the world of uh, depression as known to have an antidepressant effect, and we think that has to do with the effects on norepinephrine and serotonin. Okay, so let's get to the studies themselves. So in all neuromodulation trials, we happen to see this induction effect. So an induction effect uh, basically implies that uh, in the beginning of the device being implanted, uh, we see limited uh, effect in terms of seizure frequency. And then as time goes on, we see a much greater effect. And, uh, and it's greatly improved in terms of the seizure reduction. And so the problems with those studies that we have is that, first of all, the numbers look really great. Uh, over long periods of time, we see these numbers where patients have a very significant decrease in seizure frequency. But what we also know is that medication changes are common, and sometimes new uh, medications that were not previously available are now being added to these patients. So how do we interpret that data? How do we interpret that uh, patients who are uh, on this therapy for long periods of time, is it related to the VNS itself? or is it related to VNS plus the medications that are being given? The challenge with these studies uh, is that with long-term randomized control trials, uh, if we have a patient in a placebo or sham arm uh, getting these devices and they're not doing well, we have to give them extra medications, right? Because otherwise, we're going to increase the risk of SUDEP um, in the placebo or the sham arm. So to try to answer this question, is it really the VNS or any other device that actually makes our patients better, or is it VNS 
plus medical, best medical practice. There was a study performed in, uh, or published in 2014 where they randomized adults to either VNS plus medications or just medications. And what each arm was allowed is that they were allowed to change their seizure medications as needed. And what you see here in the blue is that patients who had both the vagus nerve stimulator placed plus the best medical practice did have a significant reduction in seizure frequency that lasted beyond the period where the honeymoon effect, honeymoon effect takes place. So we all know that for a lot of our patients, they take a medication and their seizures get better and then they get worse. Um, but rather with the VNS plus the best medical practice, they saw some improvement in seizures in the beginning and a much more significant improvement in seizures as time goes on. Now, the question is, what is the most effective setting for VNS? This is something that comes up all the time. How high should you go on the current? Should we do rapid cycling? Should we do slow cycling, medium cycling? So in a Cochrane review, uh, looking at data from four different studies, uh, the higher the current, the better the effect was in terms of reduction of uh, seizures. In terms of duty cycling, there was only one study looking at that, and there was no significant difference between rapid, medium, and slow cycles. Uh, in the world of seizure classifications, um, the, uh, in terms of VNS, there's diff five different ways of looking at it, uh, five different classes, I should say, an 80 to 100% reduction in seizures, 50 to 79%, less than 50%, no benefit at all, or magnet benefit only. And we'll look at that a little bit more. The largest uh, study looking at VNS in the pediatric population was produced in 2014, looking at over 300 kids. Uh, who were implanted between six and 18, six months to 18 years of age in 11 different European centers over a two year time period. And what they saw is about 43, about 44% of patients had their seizures cut in half over a 12 month period. And the seizure severity also decreased between 30 to 40%. And the clinical global impression among the clinicians and the patients was that uh, things improved not just in terms of seizure number, but the severity, the quality of life, and the duration. Again, in terms of what dose was the most effective, uh, it was looked at total charge delivered per day. So total charge delivered per day has to do with output current, pulse width, pulse frequency, on time, off time. And what was seen in the beginning was that there was a significant difference uh, where the higher the total charge, the more likely that you would have a responder at the six month and 12 month period. But after 12 months, there was so, no significant difference in total charge delivered per day among those groups. Okay, let's get back to Gervais. So for the Gervais subset in that population, uh, there were about 20 subjects that were identified with Gervais who had a VNS placed. Um, unfortunately, it did not specify how old the patients were at the time of implant. And at 12 months, there was about 38.5% of the patients had their seizures cut in half. So that's slightly less than the actual total cohort who had about a 43% decrease in seizures. The most recent study looking at Gervais uh, and VNS came from colleagues in Tennessee. Uh, where they identified 12 patients over a significant period of time uh, who had a VNS implanted. Nine out of those 12 patients had a greater than 50% reduction in their generalized tonic-clonic seizures, uh, two when seizure-free, one year post-implant. Of those nine who had that reduction, four had a significant improvement in cognition. Um, like we've said before in other, in other papers, there was no clear difference between the cycling. Okay, so uh, Dr. Deshoni showed this paper before. We're gonna drill down a little bit deeper to get a better sense of those numbers. Um, so this was the best paper looking at Gervais in VNS. Again, comes from Zamponi and colleagues in Italy. Um, they had eight patients. These were the settings that they were, that, um, these were the goal parameters. And you see these numbers, they don't look so amazing. A mean reduction of 6% at six months, maybe 31% at 12 months. But if you actually look at the table below, what you see is that there's one, two, three patients who had zero improvement in their seizures. So, um, but, if, but if you look closer, you'll see that about half of the patients total, four out of the eight, actually had a 50% seizure reduction. So the numbers get thrown off because we have small, uh, a small group to work with. Um, so four of the eight had a 50% seizure reduction, another patient had a 33% seizure reduction, and then three patients had no changes in their seizures at all. Now, um, vagus nerve stimulators are approved for children 12 and up. 
Um, but we actually have patients who get implanted much earlier. Uh, and so this was the best paper that I've seen thus far, uh, looking at implants at three years and younger um, with medication refractory epilepsy. They uh, reviewed 15 charts. This is out of Pittsburgh with Fernandez and Sagawa. Um, unfortunately, the actual number of seizures was not calculated. Instead, what they showed is seizure frequency judges improved, unchanged, or worsened. Out of those 15 patients, three had Dravet. They all uh, had an improvement in their seizures at 12 months. Um, but again, we don't know exactly how much they improved. Uh, and there was no statistical significant difference uh, between the parameters and seizure improvement. Okay. So last year, um, things changed in the world of open loop versus closed loop devices with the Aspire. So as we said before, and everything we've looked at thus far has been open loop devices. You program it, it turns on, off, on, off, um, regardless of how a patient's doing. And the, the VNS Aspire tried to change that um, by introducing this cardiac-based algorithm to detect heart rate uh, increase and deliver automatic stimulation. So where this comes from is that in previous papers, it was shown that about 80% of patients have what's called an ictal tachycardia. So their heart rate increases with the seizures, and that tachycardia is defined as 55% increase in heart rate. So this device is created where, they measure, where heart rate is measured um, from a baseline. So it looks at the five minutes of previous recording, and it measures the RR intervals. And then there is a seizure detector detection algorithm that can deliver a stimulation once the heart rate goes above um, whatever it's set to. So for example, if the heart rate goes above 20% of baseline or 40% of baseline or 60% of baseline, and there's other settings as well, then, um, then an extra stimulus is released. So this is an example of what that would look like. So um, you see here in the top pane um, that this is a patient's heart rate. The, in the middle pane, the uh, seizure detection algorithm is set at 20%. So once over the five minute period, the heart rate starts going above that 20% threshold, then the stimulus is released and hopefully the seizure stops. There's only two papers looking at this device thus far. Um, this one is a paper from Europe where 31 subjects had the Aspire implanted. The uh, open loop is uh, turned off, so you only are looking at the closed loop function. Uh, and they uh, randomized the uh, different algorithms that can be uh, present. So what you see here is that um, they monitored patients for about three to five days in an EMU post-implant. There were a total of 87 seizures. Um, and about only 37 of the captured 66 seizures actually had an increase of greater than 20% of the heart rate. So that those numbers that we said before about this ictal tachycardia being present 80% uh, of patients doesn't really seem to be holding up, at least in this particular study. However, um, the VNS was triggered in uh, 27 uh, of the patients. Um, and there was an overlap between the VNS trigger and the seizure in 17 of the seizures. So the most important thing that, to take away from this particular slide is the bottom box there. So it says seizure stopped during stimulation. So only 10 seizures that were of the 66 that were detected um, actually were stopped uh, at the same time as stimulation was released. But if you actually look at the number of um, at the, uh, at the percentiles here, you'll see that 59% of the treated seizures, treated seizures were aborted. So you have a 15% of total detected seizures, but there's a high number, but those that actually, that were, it, the ma machine went off, actually seem to have helped. Now, something similar was found uh, by Fisher and colleagues, um, where uh, 89 seizures were captured in 20 patients. And for when there was an overlap with the uh, algorithm and the seizure, uh, they saw 61% of the seizures were aborted. They only captured 21% of the seizures, but 61% were aborted. So that's pretty significant. So if you, get, if you can get the threshold right, uh, this can be um, something additionally new in the armamentarium. So what we need, though, those two studies only look at EMU stays that last for three to five days. So we don't actually know long term if this new device is any better than the traditional VNS. So now we've gone through traditional VNS, we have discussed um, the cardiac responsive VNS, and now we'll move to deep brain stimulation, which Dr. Dushoni touched upon as well. 
So deep brain stimulation, uh, we're stimulating deep nuclei within the brain um, that have projections to the surface of the brain and affect different seizure networks. Um, the uh, region of greatest interest is the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, and we feel that the anterior nucleus of the thalamus is involved in animal studies as part of a seizure network. So if we're able to interrupt uh, this particular uh, circuit of papez, um, we hope that uh, we can interrupt the network that's causing the seizures. Um, the biggest trial that, uh, to date uh, looking at this is a Sante trial, and what we see is that five years later, after the device is implanted, uh, there's a reduction rate of 69% of patients have their seizures cut in half, a median seizure reduction rate of also 69%. However, this is not FDA approved um, at this point. Um, in terms of the world of deep brain stimulation and, um, uh, and Dravet, um, there are three patients in the literature. Dr. Dushoni discussed two of them, and we're going to, again, drill down a little bit deeper looking at those patients. So one was a 19-year-old woman who had an anterior uh, nucleus implant, and she actually had an initial reduction of 81% of her generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Ten years later, there was a 98% reduction. That is a pretty impressive number. Uh, the next one is a 34-year-old patient who had a central median nucleus implant and there was no seizure change for two years. The electrodes were then disconnected, and she had an anterior nucleus implant instead. Again, no change up to five years. And then uh, after that, over 10 years of treatment, the seizures uh, were found to uh, be reduced between 67 or 93% seizure reduction per month. Now, the question there is, um, that's, takes a, that's a long time, actually, to see any meaningful improvement. So is it truly the device, or is there something else happening for that one patient? Um, the only other patient that is described in the literature with Dravet syndrome and deep brain stimulation comes out of France. Uh, a 19-year-old woman uh, had the subthalamic nucleus implanted, um, and she had a 41.5% mean reduction in, se in seizure frequency after two years. All right, that's what we know about deep brain stimulation um, as it pertains to Dravet syndrome. Um, and now let's talk about external stimulation. Now, unfortunately, none of these devices are yet available in the States, although the top left one here uh, is uh, currently being studied. The idea here is that you can try to stimulate the cranial nerves uh, without any surgical implantation, and hopefully you can see similar, similar results as you have with the invasive vagus nerve stimulator. Uh, so here we are uh, stimulating the trigeminal nerve. Here we're actually stimulating the vagus nerve transcutaneously. And this is known as transmagnetic stimulation, um, which, doesn't, which likely doesn't really have a role, unfortunately, at this point um, for Dravet. So for transcutaneous uh, VNS, so again, we've been talking this whole time about implanted VNS, but for transcutaneous VNS, uh, what is being done here is that there is an auricular branch of the vagus nerve that is actually here in the, in the external auditory canal in the ear. Um, the best study that I found uh, looking at this comes from 2014 in Asia, uh, where 60 patients were randomized. And they either had the earbud that is stimulating the vagal nerve um, placed in the external auditory canal or on the earlobe itself. Um, and these patients were uh, stimulated for several hours a day, every day, and followed for 12 months. And what you see um, is in the dark line on the bottom of that chart, about 40% uh, seizure reduction was found in the treatment group, as opposed to 0.85% in the um, sham or the placebo group. So that is a pretty significant uh, uh, difference. And in this, it doesn't require any surgery. Everything is obviously reversible. Um, now, the only... Uh, the only piece of literature looking at transcutaneous VNS and Dravet syndrome came from a 2015 uh, meeting at the Clinical Neurophysiology Society. Uh, it was just an abstract. It hasn't been published. Um, and they, took, they looked at a 10-year-old girl, I believe in Germany. Uh, she had four hours of daily stimulation with no changes to her seizure medications, and she had a significant reduction in her seizures, almost 60%. Again, it's only one patient, uh, but that's definitely a signal that is worth following up. Trigeminal stimulation um, is a, the trigeminal nerve, the fifth cranial nerve, is responsible for sensation of the face and head, and it, uh, it does send signals back to the brainstem, the thalamus, and the rest of the brain. Um, a phase two study was performed in 2013. Again, as Dr. Miller has already said, phase two studies were looking at safety. 
um, and patients had uh, uh, this external device uh, placed on the head for about 12 hours a day. So it's just a pad that's stimulating the forehead. Uh, there were about 50 patients who were randomized, um, and it was over an 18-week period. The 50% seizure responder rate was 40.5% of the treatment group, which sounds pretty good, until you see that there was no uh, significant difference between the treatment and the control group, which is not that great. Um, so the, uh, the group that studied this felt that this is likely secondary to a small number of patients, uh, which is possible, and now they are planning um, multi-center trials uh, and trying to do a phase three study to flesh this out better. The side effects uh, involve skin irritation, headaches, uh, which you may imagine to be the case. Again, if this may be a great option if it actually has uh, more significant numbers in the phase three. So we have now discussed the uh, external uh, stimulation devices that are uh, currently being worked up and may be applicable to the Dravet population. Uh, so then where do we go from here? Well, we see that there are signals of efficacy of neuromodulation. We see that patients do get better with neuromodulation. It may be that patients with Dravet uh, will have a less of an impressive response compared to the rest of the epilepsy population. Uh, and. And I know a topic that's coming up here uh, within the foundation is creating best practice guidelines. And where does neuromodulation fit in that? And does VNS fit in part of the discussions that we have together, patients and physicians alike? And in order to um, push that forward, uh, we definitely would benefit from more Trevay VNS studies. Um, and that can either be done uh, through you looking at multi-centers, um, utilizing registries, which I think as I've had a couple of conversations with people here already, um, the registries are, um, are underutilized and I think can be very helpful in terms of, of better understanding of how effective this device would, would be. And also we need more studies looking and comparing whether the cardiac uh, responsive neurostimulation through VNS is any better than the traditional VNS. Um, all other neuromodulation studies for Gervais uh, would, can occur once FDA approves those devices. All right, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.